All right, thanks for coming, okay. everybody. Uh, um, we are delighted to have uh, Zohar. Uh, I can't pronounce your surname. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Just uh, who's visiting from the Simons Institute, Simons Center in, uh, in Stony Brook. Thanks for agreeing to give the talk. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, as uh, Dan Joy said, my name is Zohar. Um, I met some of you before, some I did not meet. Um, but thanks for coming anyway. And please unmute yourself whenever you are feeling like asking any question. Uh, it's a small group, so I don't believe there will there is a chance of you know too many interruptions. So let feel free. Um, yeah, the talk is going to begin a little bit slow, and then I'll get into a little bit more details for the benefit of those who are more expert on this field. But the beginning will be more for the benefit of those who work on different fields. Okay, so let me begin with some very gentle introduction. So there is <clears throat> a fundamental result uh, about symmetries in physics is the Nether theorem, which uh, states that if there are continuous transformations of the laws of nature or the action, which leave the action invariant, this leads, this leads to a conserved current. Um, and the key word here is continuous transformations. Um, that leads to a conserved current, which can then be integrated uh, over a space-like slice to, gener to, to, to um, obtain an integral of motion or a conserved charge. So uh, this is a very classic piece of uh, physics that we learn in undergrad. And a very important additional fact is that all these transformations that leave the action invariant lead to some sort of a group structure. Uh, the group uh, is going to be denoted by G. Now this is in classical physics. In quantum physics, the story is a little bit more interesting. Uh, I think it was mostly realized by Wigner, but I might be wrong. Uh, so the idea is that G uh, is realized on the Hilbert space in quantum mechanics via representations, linear representations of G. And in fact, there is a little bit of um, additional technical detail, which is important, is that these representations can be projective. It will not be important for understanding many pieces of this talk, but it's uh, important to keep in mind that these representations could be projective. Furthermore, the, the symmetries uh, correspond to unitary operators. So the symmetries lead to unitary operators on the Hilbert space. And being that U is a unitary, it's also, in, it's also invertible. And that will also be very important soon. So U, and, U dagger is the inverse matrix of U. Now, <clears throat> I will be abusing a little bit the terminology. Um, so just to make sure that it does not lead to a confusion, I will often, uh, I will often refer to you as a topological operator. So hopefully this terminology would not be confusing, but let me explain why I refer to, is a, refer to it as a topological operator. It, there is an integral here over some d minus one dimensional slice of space time, which is usually considered to be a space like slice. But in fact, the unitary operator as a matrix that acts on the Hilbert space does not depend on the choice of this uh, space like slice. For this reason, I will refer to you as a topological operator because its dependence on the space like slice is uh, immaterial. Um, so I'll often refer to such an operator as a co-dimension one topological operator. Co-dimension one because it involves some choice of a space of a d minus one dimensional space. And topological is because this choice is not very important as long as uh, you are discussing small deformations. Okay, so this is just the classical quantum mechanics. Sorry, I meant to say uh, textbook quantum mechanics uh, from the first half of the previous century. I think that people have uh, appreciated a little bit more recently, but also uh, many years ago, is that such unitary operators. Uh, that act on the Hilbert space and depend topologically on a space that slice exist also for discrete symmetries. Even though Nether's theorem doesn't say anything about discrete symmetries, in quantum mechanics, when there is a discrete symmetry, 
there is a unitary operator that depends topologically on the choice of slice. In this case, however, one usually cannot write an explicit expression for this operator as an integral over space like slice. There is no explicit expression, but the operator must still exist. Now, these operators, which are called dimension one and topological, lead to some sort of group, as I've already mentioned. And the way we think about it geometrically is that there could be some local operator. Then we can wrap uh, this d minus one dimensional surface around it. We get the usual action of the operator on the, on the, of the symmetry on the local operator. And if we wrap them consecutively, we get the group law, which actually may not be commutative. So it's, it has to be associative, but it doesn't have to be commutative. So wrapping different symmetry operators in different orders can lead to different results. Okay, and uh, this is all pretty much textbook material. And then there is a lot of discussion in the textbooks about how to gauge symmetries. What does it mean for symmetries to be spontaneously broken, explicitly broken, and so on. So this was just a quick review. I'll just uh, stop here for a second if there are any questions or concerns or comments. Sorry, can I, can I just ask quickly? Right. Um, you, you, you said that um, you're constructing the charges by wrapping a surface around them, around the sources. Um, are, you, are you assuming the surfaces are, are compact without boundary or do you allow for open surfaces oh, as well? In the, the general, in the general uh, framework of symmetries in quantum field theory or quantum mechanics, you're allowed to consider any co-dimension one surface and yeah. ask various different questions. But if you want to understand how symmetries act on local operators, which is a question, you can, con the answer is given by wrapping this co-dimension one surface around the local operator. Another equivalent point of view, which is more common in textbooks, is that you consider the commutator, which involves putting the surface a little bit below and subtracting uh, the result from what um, happens if you put the surface a little bit above. And the commutator is the same by a contour manipulation as wrapping the surface around the local operator. And if your uh, observable is not local, uh, then what do you do? Right. So actually, the question of how do symmetries act on the non-local observables, such as on Wilson lines or yes. other, it's actually not well defined. You have to think about it case by case. There could be ambiguities because like if your observable is a line, there is no consistent way of uh, defining a commutator or wrapping around because you cannot wrap something that's called dimension one around the line. You can only wrap yeah. it around the point. So this uh, inevitably leads to some sort of ambiguities at the point where there is an intersection, where they cut each other, and you have to resolve it. And there is a big, big discussion of that in the literature. Uh, sometimes it's just not well defined. There is no sensible way to answer this question. You have, it depends on some ambiguities, which depend on the model, and so on. So there is no answer to this question in, in general. Sorry, can I, can I just ask, um, when you say co-dimension one, your, your diagram makes it look as though it's co-dimension one in space. Is it co-dimension one in space or co-dimension one in space-time? Oh, this space is a space-time diagram. So this is, the, okay. this is a space-time diagram because it's like the same as the commutator. So you move in time. So you should think about the vertical direction as time and the horizontal direction as space. It's co-dimension one in space-time. Thanks. Uh, since we've, uh, in, we've integrated over the whole space and this space time dimension. All right. Any more, any more uh, interesting comments? All right. So I'll, the main point of this talk is that I'll tell you about two generalizations of the notion of symmetry that do not fall under the netter uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, one of them is very surprising. One is a tiny bit a little le less surprising. But I'll tell you about both of ge these generalizations and how they uh, turn out to be important in the analysis of Young Mills theories. So let's discuss the first generalization. This generalization 
is called a one form symmetry. It's a new kind of symmetry. Um, so the ordinary network charges are called zero form symmetries in this terminology. And these symmetries are going to be called one form symmetries. Okay, that's the terminology. Let me explain what it is. Uh, these objects do not follow from Netter's theorem, but yet they are symmetries. And they play an important role in many quantum field theories. So let me explain what they are. These are still unitary operators. That's the first point. But, and they're still associated to some uh, symmetry. But <clears throat> now they're called dimension two. So the surface on which you, so to speak, integrate uh, your whatever density is now co-dimension two. Instead of being co-dimension one, it's now co-dimension two. So it's co-dimension one in space. All right. Uh, this is called the one form symmetry. In principle, you could also imagine unitary operators that depend topologically on co-dimension three, co-dimension four surfaces, but I will not discuss it today. So if you have a unitary operator that depends topologically on the co-dimension two surface, that's called the one form symmetry in the literature. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's a generalization that ter will turn out to be very important. And I'll give you examples of applications of it. So um, when I say depends topologically, what I mean is that this operator depends on a co-dimension two surface, but again, small deformations of the surface would not change the unitary. So you can ask, are there such objects in quantum field theory? What kind of selections rule do they lead to? Can we gauge them? Can we spontaneously break the symmetries? Can they have anomalies? And so on. So that was the first type of generalization that I'm going to discuss today. The second type is much more surprising in my view because it really violates Netter's theorem brutally. So for ordinary symmetries that come from transformations of the action of the type that Netter studied, we have that the, there is always an inverse. So for every transformation, you can reverse the transformation and uh, there is this identity. You can draw this identity algebraically by going back to this picture and choosing G prime to be the inverse of G. Then this would be a trivial surface because G G prime would be one. And uh, Sigma one is just a trivial surface that doesn't act on anything. So in Netter's theorem, since it's or the origin of these topological surfaces is the tra some transformations of the action, uh, this must be true. There must be an inverse. But it turned out more recently that there exists in quantum field theories, sometimes unitary operators, which depend topologically on some co-dimension one surface. So now it's again co-dimension one, but they do, not, they do not admit an inverse. These operators are operators on the Hilbert space are simply not invertible. So it's a topological operator, namely it's an integral of motion, but it does not admit an inverse. So therefore it cannot come from a transformation of the action. And uh, it's kind of surprising because uh, you would think that Netter's theorem goes both ways, but it's actually not true. If we go back to Netter's theorem, what it actually says is that transformations of the action lead to, to conserved quantities, but never, never did Netter say that conserved quantities must come from transformations of the action. And indeed this is not, so recently it was appreciated that there are interesting conserved quantities which do not come from transformations of the action. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Okay. Anytime. Uh, well, there is a lot of literature on half algebras as symmetries. Yes. And since there are algebras, zero is an element of the algebra. And there are plenty of operators there which are not invertible in the normal sense. Mm -hmm. are, you, are these included in your discussion? Uh, this uh, subject that I'm going to talk about is related to Hopf algebras, though it's not identical. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but the mathematical, the math mathematical structure that these non-invertible symmetries obey is called the fusion, uh, a fusion category. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit, question. yeah. One mm -hmm. more remark is localization of <clears throat> symmetries has been done by Do Doppler and Roberts in one of their old papers on uh, exactly this using Kunz algebras, they localize the 
the noetal symmetries to bounded regions in space time. Okay? Yes. You probably are aware of it, but just a remark. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. Thanks for the remark. Okay, so my goal in this talk is to give you a, some kind of flavor of how these two different generalizations of the notion of symmetry arise, what do they imply, and so on. So I'll argue that both are interesting generalizations. Let's start from the first one. So this, I'll first discuss the first one, which is the existence of uh, topological operators associated to a co-dimension two, uh, co-dimension two space of space-time, co-dimension two subset of space-time. So uh, these are the so-called one-form symmetries, and this terminology was introduced in this paper. They were the first ones to use this terminology. Now, the first observation about this uh, co-dimension two symmetries is that they must be abelian. How do you see that they must be abelian? Well, since these topological operators are associated to a co-dimension two surface rather than the co-dimension one, you can freely move them across each other without having to uh, intersect without contact terms. This is impossible for co-dimension one surfaces since you cannot move G past G prime without, having an, without them intersecting at some point. But now you can move them past each other without intersecting and that leads to an abelian algebra. So the first lemma or the first little result is that one form symmetries must be abelian. So let's discuss the simplest example that has one form symmetries. And surprisingly, the simplest example is nothing but Maxwell's theory. Just free theory of a U1, a, the free U1 gauge theory in these space-time dimensions. This is the action. And let's say that we're in four dimensions, four space-time dimensions, I should say. So here are the explicit expressions for the unitary operators, which are associated to a co-dimension two surface. So <clears throat> you see, we integrate uh, F minu over a space-like slice, a co-dimension one uh, subspace of the space-like slice. So it's co-dimension two in space-time. Or we can integrate out the dual of F over the same co-dimension one subset of space or co-dimension two subset of space-time. There are two different parameters associated to these unitaries. So this is a family, two, a family of two unitaries that act on the Hilbert space of QED. Uh, so it's not even QED, just free Maxwell. Uh, and they depend topologically on this surface. So you have to prove a little theorem, which is probably obvious, which is that the deformations of this co-dimension two surface uh, doesn't change the answer, doesn't change this unitary. How do you prove that? Well, this is a closed form. And also this is a closed form by virtue of the fact that we have no matter fields. Both are closed form. One is due to the Bianca identity. One is due to the fact that we have no sources, no matter fields. So they depend topologically on this co-dimension two surface. So this is the simplest example. Now, being that this is a co-dimension two charge, it doesn't act on local operators. There is no sense in which something of co-dimension two can act on a local operator because you cannot wrap it around the local operator. Instead, you can wrap it around the line. So somebody asked at the beginning of what happens if you try to act with a symmetry on a line. And I said that the answer doesn't make sense in general. But when you try to act with one form symmetries on lines, that's exactly what you should do because lines can be wrapped by co-dimension two surfaces. So there is a class of symmetries that act on lines on the non-local operators. And indeed, this U alpha and U alpha twiddle act on Wilson at hoof lines by just giving, multiplying them by various phases. So free U1 Maxwell theory admits uh, defects, it admits non-local operators, which are called Wilson at hoof lines where you just integrate the gauge field over some world line and they are acted upon by these guys. Okay, so Maxwell's theory has a U1 times U1 one form symmetry. It's a billion, as I said, and it acts on the Wilson at hoof lines. And it has many funny applications. The, there are probably by now several hundreds of papers on various uh, funny applications of this thing for just free Maxwell theory. There is a lot of work on that in condensed matter theory and a lot of work on that in high energy physics. Even just for Maxwell theory, this answered some uh, previously unknown questions, previously puzzling questions. I won't go into that though, because this is a little bit uh, too technical. 
I'll just say one thing, that this U1 symmetries, which are one form symmetries, people have realized that they're actually spontaneously broken. So this one form symmetries can also be spontaneously broken in the same way that the ordinary symmetry can be spontaneously broken. So the photon, the photon that we see in nature was actually identified as the number Goldstone boson of the spontaneous breaking of the symmetry. You must be aware of the fact that many people wanted to understand in what sense is the photon a number Goldstone boson. And now we understand it. It's the number Goldstone boson of a one form symmetry, not of an ordinary symmetry. Another thing that was very important in the discussions in the papers in condensed matter and high energy physics is that there is a Tooft anomaly in this U1 times U1. It turns out that you cannot simultaneously gauge both symmetries. This boils down to Dirac's uh, obstruction in having electric and magnetic charges. So you cannot gauge both symmetries simultaneously. This is interpreted as a Tooft anomaly. And this has various interesting applications. Okay, this was just a quick review of free Maxwell's theory. Are there any questions about some of these uh, quick statements I've made about Maxwell's theory before I go to pure Young Mills theory? Can I ask a quick question, Sohar? Anytime. Uh, you, you said that if, if there are no sources, why are these integrals not just zero? Oh, that's a great question. Well, the integrals, um, you see the integrals, let's just go back to this just for one second. You see, if you, if you have an ordinary charge, any, any symmetry, like an ordinary symmetry, and you make a closed surface with nothing inside, it will be zero or one more precisely because there is nothing inside. So it's topological, you can just collapse it. So the same is true for one form symmetries. One form symmetries, if these two dimensions, if this co-dimension two surface is compact and space time has no holes, it will be trivial of course, but you can also put a source. Uh, so this picture is entirely analogous to the previous one. When there is a source inside the cycle that's otherwise collapsible or contractible, then this leads to a non-zero action on the source. Oh, so when you say this is pure Maxwell, yeah, when I said mean, no, the sources are not dynamical, is what you're saying, is that correct? Yeah, yeah I should have okay, said. Okay, okay, I see. Thank you, thank you. So these operators are topological because there are no dynamical charges. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. if you study the Wilson lines, which describe the world lines of non-dynamical charges, they act on them non-trivially. Yes, yeah, thank you. So I should have made this distinction more clear. It's dynamical versus non-dynamical. In fact, the same is true for ordinary symmetries. An ordinary symmetry is obeyed when there are, non -dynamic, when there are no dynamical particles that break the symmetry. But the local operators that keep, well, I'm just saying that it's, it's basically the same. Uh, it's the same statement in some way. Um, any further questions about, I haven't told you why people are so interested in this Maxwell theory and it's one form symmetries, but at least are there any questions about the statement that these symmetries exist in this theory? Okay, let me move on to young Mills theory. This is a much more interesting theory, as of course you know. Uh, unlike Maxwell's theory, it's not solvable, at least not for now. The hero of this game is going to be the theta angle of young Mills theory, which is 2 pi periodic by virtue of the fact that this instanton number is integral. This theory turns out to have a one form symmetry. But now, in, uh, unlike Maxwell's theory, which had uh, two copies of U1, here there is only one copy, and it's not U1, it's Zn. As I said, it must be a billion. So it's a billion in this case as well. So uh, I'm, I can give you a, an intuitive explanation for why, unlike Maxwell's theory, there is only one copy of Zn. So let me just give you an intuitive explanation. So in Maxwell's theory, there were two copies of U1. Uh, why were there two copies of a U1 one form symmetry? Because there were no magnetic charges and no electric charges, which are dynamical. Okay? No dynamical electric charges, no dynamical magnetic charges. And that's why both of these things are topological. Now in Jan Mill's theory, as you probably know very well, uh, in some sense, there are hidden monopoles. Even if you don't put monopoles by hand in this Lagrangian, when people studied 
let's say, as you engage theory on the lattice, there are monopoles. You cannot prevent monopoles from existing. So you cannot really consistently get rid of monopoles. In fact, people even believe that confinement uh, is, 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 is triggered by the condensation of monopoles, even though there are no monopoles in the Lagrangian. So young mills theory is supposed to have monopoles whether you want it or not. And that's comment number one. So that's why there is no analog of u alpha twiddle. Sorry, I meant to say, yeah, that's why there is no analog of uh, u one twiddle, u a alpha twiddle. Now u alpha is also restricted to the end uh, for the for the reason that the max in Maxwell's theory the electric field itself is charged. So that there there are dynamical charges, but these dynamical charges are mod n, so they are in the adjoint representation. So there are no matter fields in the fundamental or fundamental squared and so on until you get to mod n where there are dynamical fields due to the Maxwell field itself. And what is N here, uh, capital N? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I should have said, the gauge group is SUN. Okay. Yeah, so when the gauge group is SUN, uh, electric charges which are zero mod N can be screened in their analogy sense. But uh, electric charges, probe electric charges, which are not zero mod N cannot be screened by the electric field or gluon fluctuations. So there is a one form symmetry, which is discrete. And because it's discrete, unlike Maxwell's theory, I cannot give you an explicit expression for the conserved notary, for the unitary that is going to act on the Hilbert space. It's discrete, so you cannot write it, but it exists. Okay, so are there any, any comments? Just interrupt. Now, Another thing about Maxwell's theory that sorry. so yeah, let me just uh, ask again. So you you're gonna everything you say will be will be you'll require this theta term. Is that correct? Well, this doesn't require. If theta, it. If theta were zero, then you're then you're not going to uh, then yeah. No, th this statement that there is a Zn one form symmetry is correct at all theta. Okay. Even at theta equals zero. It even okay, has interesting you. implications at theta equals zero. I'll mention some of them below. Thank but you. you're right that the most interesting implications will be for non-zero theta. Now, theta and minus theta describe the same Young-Mills theory because there is a parity symmetry um, or a CP symmetry. Sorry, just, I mean, I'm curious to know, is there a fundamental reason why one can't write down a formula for the, U, the UN symmetry? It must be related to the center of, uh, of SUN. Yeah, but you cannot write you cannot write this unitary in terms of the local operators in the action. No, I I, I see the difficulty, but then I mean that it presumably will be written down at some point, and just the question is, no. you don't think you don't think so? No, it's never going to be written down. Okay, but we don't need to write it down because we can perform. I mean, we can answer questions that without writing it down. It can't be right that you can't write it down. Say again. You, you can't say that you can't write it down. I mean, if it exists, um, there's some way of computing it. It's just that it's not a, uh, an integral or an exponential of an integral. That's correct. That's what I meant by saying that you cannot write it down. I cannot write it as an exponential of an integral of a local quantity. Yeah, well, you want to be careful of your statements. Yeah, well. Well, no, if, you gave me a lattice, if you gave me a lattice model, like Wilson's lattice description of young Mill theory, I can write it down using the plaquettes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, very good. Uh, but I cannot write it down using continuum variables as an exponential of a local density. Yeah. How would you write it in terms of the uh, plaquette variables? Okay, uh, let me just... Um, well, we can come back to it afterwards. I don't want to distract you. That's fine. No, no, I, I can tell you the answer right away. So if you want to take Wilson's action for non-abelian young mills theory, and you want to, let's say, take a two-dimensional slice of this four-dimensional space-time and put on that slice this, uh, this operator, right? Because we're talking about co-dimension two. What you do is that you uh, take, a, okay, so what you do is that you take the complementary two-dimensional space to this two-dimensional slice. And at one point on this complementary two-dimensional space, you flip the sign of G young mills. 
So you make GM Mills negative at one point on the complementary two-dimensional space. That leads to some funny dislocation in the lattice action in the other two dimensions. And that corresponds to inserting uh, this unitary on that two dimensional space. Okay, very nice. Okay. All right. And then I take a second. Good. So there is a very, very explicit construction of that on the lattice, if you allow me to flip the sign of GN Mills at one point. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, that's no problem. But I don't know how to do it in the continuum using continuous variables. But it, it doesn't mean that it okay. doesn't exist. It perfectly well exists. We can do all formal manipulations. We can comp No, no, I appreciate that. I, I just wanted to get an, an image for what it was yeah. doing, which you have given me. Yeah, okay. Can I make a, uh, ask a question? Suppose I consider a particle on a circle. Okay? Then, the, for example, the Dirac operator or the Dirac uh, Laplacian have a one parameter family of self adjoint extensions okay, corresponding to the magnetic field. You're right. Unseen, okay. So that is a, those extensions are parameterized by a circle, S1. Yes. So the dual is Z, the group Z. So the S1, which are intertainers between different reps, can be written down. Okay. They are intertainers, they are not in the uh, irreducible representation of the circle, but the intertainers can be written down. The dual is Z, okay? That looks like the kind of things that is happening here. And yeah, this, I I'm sorry. I think you yeah, can... You're right. it. yeah, yeah. It's analogous. The theta angle here and the theta angle that appears in the theory of the particle in a circle yeah. are very analogous. They're yes, both I... associated to the fact that pi 1 of configuration space is non-zero. Indeed, yes. So, so, but in that case, I think you can... Uh, Probably construct the uh, Pontryagin dual of the circle, uh, and right off constructing the intertwiner. I can construct the intertwiner here as well, but that's not the same as the one-form symmetry. The one-form symmetry is not the intertwiner, and that I don't know how to construct using continuum variables. Is it not the same in that case as the dual of the intertwiners, uh, the group of the intertwiners? Well, I don't want to say something wrong, but the uh, in that case of a particle in a circle, there is obviously no notion of a one-form symmetry, since it's associated to a co-dimension two, and the particle in a circle doesn't have co-dimension two. Okay. It's uh, already quantum mechanics. Okay. I think the intertwiners that you're talking about are the similarity transformations that you must um, perform when you take theta to theta plus two pi. And those I can write down even in this model explicitly. Yes. Uh, but they have nothing to do with the one form symmetry. I know, but the dual, the, the Pontryagin dual of the group of the intertrainers seems like a discrete, is a discrete group. And the question is I think you can write it down by using half algebra techniques, but I'm not sure. You might be right. I don't know much about what you have in mind. Well, the so, dual, you are going to get the dual of this. Uh, you might be right, but uh, I'm, let me just emphasize that writing okay. down okay. the question of whether or not we can write it down explicitly is kind of besides the point, because by now we can do all sorts of computations without writing it down. Okay. Now, I want to say a few words about theta, which will be very important. As you know, there are two special values of theta in young mills theory which are uh, which are which are more special than the other values those are zero and pi because they both admit time reversal symmetry so pi is the point where there is time reversal symmetry because time reversal takes pi to minus pi by by virtue of the periodicity of the theta angle pi and minus pi are the same point in configure in theory space so uh, theta is equals zero and pi are both uh, time reversal invariant now, there is the most difficult statement about this theory that I'm not going to prove to you, but I'll quote it. It's proven in the literature. At theta equals pi, there is an anomaly, a Tooft anomaly, or an ABJ-like anomaly, uh, involving the one-form symmetry, Zn, and time reversal symmetry. So there is some sort of incompatibility because between time reversal symmetry and the one-form symmetry. And this incompatibility is called the Tooft anomaly. 
And this tooth anomaly leads to constraints on the phase diagram of young Mills theory. So this is a really cool application of this one form symmetries that uh, we that there is a concrete constraint on the phase diagram due to this uh, incompatibility of the one form symmetry and time reversal symmetry. Now, at eta equals zero, we expect confinement. Confinement is the same as unbroken one form symmetry. Because as I told you before, broken, spontaneously broken one form symmetry means something like deconfinement. It means that there are massless gluons, which can be interpreted as the number Goldstone bosons of that symmetry. So confinement is the opposite of that. And that means unbroken one form symmetry. That's what the clay prize is all about to prove that this is true. So the funny thing is that using one form symmetries, well, one cannot say much about theta equals zero, but one can say that this cannot be true at theta equals pi because of this incompatibility of between the symmetries. So at theta equals pi, the ground state of Young Mills theory cannot be actually trivial. Uh, it contradicts um, the Tooft anomaly matching principle for one form symmetries. So let me just give you a proposal for the phase diagram of Young Mills theory that, uh, <laughs> that is consistent with this anomaly involving the one form symmetry. So could I ask, is this something one can actually prove? Uh, um, let's say at the level of, of, uh, of gauge theory, of uh, lattice gauge theory? Uh, this is, okay, this is a great question, but as you know very well, uh, theta equals pi is a difficult theory to study on the lattice. Uh -huh. That's because the lattice is not very happy with the theta angle. There is no natural way to write the theta angle on the lattice that would guarantee that it would be the same as we call theta in the continuum. However, theta equals pi is still a very special theory where there is time reversal symmetry. And condensed matter people have different ways of thinking about it using not Wilson's lattice, but more like quantum antiferromagnets type uh, of, a, of, an, of modeling. And there, yeah, you can prove it very rigorously. Yeah, I, but not in I the understand. Wilson yeah. Not in the Wilson lattice. The Wilson lattice is very difficult. Yet we can. Well, it must be analogous to the spin, uh, to, to the spin one and spin a half in the antiferromagnetic models. Yes, you are you are right? completely on you are completely on on point. Okay. Uh, in fact, in the paper paper in the literature about this anomaly, that's exactly how it's explained. Yeah, uh, it's explained as being analogous to the Haldane anomaly of the spin a half antiferromagnet. It's very similar mathematics, in fact. So this leads to find, in the same way that Haldane obtained non-trivial constraints on you know, the long distance limit of this quantum antiferromagnet, surprisingly, one, one is led to non-trivial constraints on the phase diagram of young Mills theory now. So let me just tell you what, this is the culmination of some work of what people believe is the phase diagram of young Mills theory as a function of theta and temperature. T is the temperature, theta is the theta angle. So at theta, let's go over theta equals zero quickly. So at small temp at low temperatures, the one form symmetry is unbroken. You're in a confined phase, but at um, high temperatures, there is deconfinement and the one form symmetry is broken spontaneously. So the ZN is broken, you have massless gluons. That's the quark gluon plasma that the uh, people are studying uh, in uh, various accelerators. But the theta equals pi, already at zero temperature, the ground state must be non-trivial. So that stands for a certain second or first order transition, depends on uh, you know, the dynamics. And then this transition must persist and it must only disappear at temperatures which are above the deconfinement transition. And this is the temperature where time reversal symmetry will be restored and the one form symmetry will be spontaneously broken. So um, it's actually not something that in ADS-CFT for some reason, this inequality is saturated. So these two lines exactly coincide. And I still don't understand why. There might be a reason for why this inequality must be strictly saturated. Or maybe in large n gauge theories. But in large n, in the large n limit of SUN Young Mills theory, we know what this line is. It just stands for the spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry, which could also be useful phenomenologically. And then this time reversal symmetry is eventually restored via an Ising transition. But there is a puzzle here for the experts that uh, is still eluding, the, eluding us, which is why do these two temperatures coincide in ADS-CFT? 
So are we supposed to see a second order transition at that point? Yes. And, and, and completely matching with icing? I believe so. That's our mm -hmm. prediction. Uh, so the just just an, an, an observation, Zahar. That looks very, very like phase diagrams I've seen for n equals two Susie Yang Mills. I am not sure exactly which ones you refer to, but I'll be happy. Is that a Witten solution of n equals Susie Yang Mills? No, I know what you, yeah, I know, but I don't know which, what are the vertical and long, what would be the vertical and horizontal axis? Oh, well, no, I'd, I'd, I'd replace D with, with uh, the Yang Mills, sorry, temperature with the Yang Mills coupling. Yes. The monotonic function. So you could, re, you could redraw it in terms of the Yang Mills coupling in theta. Ah, but actually, one over G squared in theta, to be more precise. I see. I'm not sure that I know what you mean, but... Uh, it's, really, it's modular symmetry. Oh. It's a modular symmetry of, of n equals two young mills. Uh, I, I just right. not able to understand right now what you have in mind, but... Well, maybe I'm we can happy. talk about it later. Yeah, I'm just not able to process it yeah. now. Um, it is indeed true that in cyber witness theory, you can draw similar diagrams and theta equals pi would be a special point where there is a massless, well, in fact, there will be a massless monopole and a massless dion around theta equals pi. Here, we're talking about spontaneous time reversal symmetry breaking at theta equals pi. I just want to uh, make one quick comment about this uh, situation that there is spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry. So it's not something that's very common. Uh, there are not many quantum field theories that you know which break spontaneously time reversal symmetry, but that's one. So I just wanted to make some funny comment about what would happen if you were to try to do it on the lattice, and then you would have two regions of space. In one region, you would put one vacuum, and in the other one, the vacuum that's related to it by time reversal symmetry. And then these two vacuum would be separated by an interface, which we call a domain wall. So a funny thing is that in each of these vacua, there is still confinement. That's indeed visible in this picture. This is the deconfinement curve, okay? And uh, there is confinement here. So we have two vacua, which are each confining, namely quarks must be bound here to hadrons of various sorts, but there is a domain wall. And the prediction of this anomaly which is again analogous to some mathematics that appears in the Haldane model for who, those who know it, is that actually the quarks become anions on the domain wall. So if you take a probe quark, it's confined in the bulk. But when you bring it to this interface, it becomes uh, an object with fractional spin. So very strangely, the quark, which has a spin a half as a fundamental particle, becomes an anion of spin one over two n, where n is the rank of the group. So you can think about this interface as a quantum Hall state. In a quantum Hall state, there are anions. And this is a very particular abelian quantum Hall state uh, with fractional spins. So it's a very strange phase of yang mills theory where the quarks are deconfined, the gauge fields are deconfined, but there is topological order like in the quantum Hall state, namely there are anions. This is a prediction just follows just from this anomaly involving the one form symmetry. This, of course, has not been verified on the lattice because simulating on the lattice uh, theta equals pi is not easy. But I believe it can be verified in the future. Okay, I won't make this comment and I also skip this thing to get to the second topic and I'll stop for questions. Any questions about the, this little story about Yang Mills theory? Okay. Let's move on. I have 15, sorry. Yes, I have 15 more minutes. So this was a story about higher symmetries. Now I'll tell you a, a story about a, um, which I think is more surprising and more difficult mathematically about the co conservation laws that do not follow from any symmetry. And to explain this concept, I'll start from the Ising model in two dimensions at the critical point. So it's a conformal field theory. This is the simplest, I'm re the reason I'm starting from this model, uh, it's the simplest model which admits a, these funny symmetries that do not come from the action. So the two dimensional Ising model has three famous operators, the unit operator, the spin operator, and the energy operator. 
and they obey some operator algebra like this. One famous symmetry uh, of the Ising model is, of course, just the spin flip symmetry that's manifest both in the lattice and in the continuum. It's an ordinary symmetry of the Noether type, except that it's discrete. So this symmetry, what it does is to flip the sign of sigma. Sigma goes to minus sigma, and you see it's a symmetry of everything. But there is another symmetry, which is much less obvious, and it doesn't follow from the action, which involves flipping the sign of epsilon and taking sigma to zero. This is a very non-obvious symmetry, um, but it's a symmetry of all the correlation functions appropriately interpreted. Let me just tell you the algebraic structure of the symmetry. The fact that this symmetry exists in the Ising model was noted already many years ago, but people have not appreciated the fact that this is a very common feature of many two-dimensional theories, including some young Mills theories in two dimensions. So this is the algebra of symmetries. This is not an ordinary group, but let me just dissect it for you. U is an ordinary Z2 symmetry. That's the one that is familiar from the lattice description or continuum description of the Ising model. So U is an ordinary Z2 symmetry. That's why it squares to one. It's clearly invertible and unitary. The other symmetry that's much less obvious is called here curly N. Curly N obeys this algebra. So N times U is the same as U times N, which is the same as N. And N times N is one plus U. So the main thing here is that u is not that n is not invertible. There is nothing you can multiply n by to get one. And it's also a non-trivial fact that this is a consistent set of rules. You can just play with these rules, multiply them from u from left to right, multiply by n, and you'll see that it's all self-consistent. That's not obvious, but it's true. Okay, so this is the simplest algebra that includes a symmetry which is non-invertible. That's how this algebra is realized on the Hilbert space. Okay, so N is a symmetry of the Ising model. This clearly cannot correspond to a group because of what I said, N is not invertible, but it's, com it's a certain commutative structure. The more generally, it doesn't have to be commutative. It's just that in the Ising model, it turns out to be commutative. Are there any questions about the algebra itself? Uh, and then I'll go to uh, a, some maybe less trivial examples of this phenomenon, that there are some symmetries that don't come from the action, symmetries of the action. Are there any questions about this or? Or is, or is there any relation to one form symmetry in this non-invertible case? Uh, the voice sounds familiar. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. It's, it's me, Anton. Okay, yeah. Yeah, what I, what I'm saying, uh, I, I'm asking if, uh, if there is a relation of uh, one form symmetry uh, that you described before to this non invertible sector. No, this is code dimension one. So, N, okay. you ah, are okay. both ordinary code dimension one charges. So, you have, they correspond to some integrals of motion on code dimension one surfaces. Okay. Yeah, this is completely unrelated to one form symmetry. Okay, okay. These are some integrals of motion that do not correspond to symmetries of the action. And they're not, they're realized on the Hilbert space as non-invertible operators. I see, yes. It's very surprising that such things exist, but um, anyway, I don't understand exactly why they exist, but uh, they nevertheless exist. Now I'll tell you about some implication of these things. They have far reaching implications for the dynamics of non-trivial two dimensional filters. I'll just tell you about one application quickly since I'm running out of time. And then I'll make a few comments about naturalness and I'll end the talk. So the next few slides I'll probably go through very quickly. But still, if there are any questions, stop me. So this, a simple example that we decided to study, um, hoping that we can make progress on this problem given that maybe it has some non-obvious symmetries, is the two-dimensional adjoint QCD model. So we have a gauge field in two, dimension, in two dimensions, and also a fermion psi in the Majorana wild adjoint representation. This model has been studied by many authors, uh, most famously 
there is a, lo a paper from the late 90s by David Gross, Klebanov, Matitsin, Smilga, and Hashimoto with some very nice observations about this model. This, the reason that this model is so interesting is that it doesn't have fundamental quarks, only adjoint quarks, and yet it seems to be deconfined, meaning there is some screening of Wilson loops, even though there is no fundamental matter to screen the Wilson loops. But uh, some aspects of this model uh, are still completely unclear, and that's why we decided to look at it again. So the bottom line of what we found is that when this model is massless, there is actually a huge number, which is exponential in N, where N is again the rank of the group. So the gauge group is again SUN, which I forgot to write. But <clears throat> there is an exponential number of conservation rules which do not come from symmetries. In fact, there are only few symmetries of this action, which I'm listing on this slide. There are actually just two Z2 symmetries, which flip the fermion. And um, so one Z2 action just flips the right moving fermion, and the other Z2 action uh, flips both fermions, and it's part of the Lorentz group. So this model doesn't really have many, th that many symmetries. You can't use, the symmetries are not very powerful in this model. But there is a huge exponential number of uh, non-ordinary symmetries or non-invertible symmetries uh, that are extremely constraining. And I'm going to tell you what we've been able to do with the symmetries. So let me just tell you what Gross, Klebanov, Matitsin, Smilga, and Hashimoto found. What they found was that for SU2, the SU2 gauge theory case, they claimed that the model was zero mass is deconfined. By deconfined, I mean that Wilson loops are screened. And furthermore, they found that the Z2 symmetry that I quoted here quickly is spontaneously broken. So there are two vacua. Okay, but the situation for SUN remained somewhat puzzling for many years. And there was a very nice recent progress about made uh, by Chairman Jacobson, Tanizaki, and Unsel. They basically argued that the Perhaps for SUN with N bigger than two, only this Wilson line is screened. So only the Wilson line with N over two boxes for even N is screened, but other Wilson lines with fewer boxes uh, are confined, not screened. And that would match what Gross et al found for N equals two, since for N equals two, this is just the fundamental Wilson line. And uh, it's screened according to the paper of Gross et al. Okay, so this was the situation when we started thinking about it. But none of these papers have noted that this theory has a huge number of symmetries which are non-invertible. So with this symmetry, we managed to uh, get uh, quite a bit of mileage. So the first thing that we found was that the massless theory, in fact, is completely deconfined. All the Wilson lines are deconfined for all representations. So even though this model doesn't have dynamical quarks in the fundamental representation, it's completely deconfined. That's a result number one that follows from this uh, integrals of motion. The second result that follows from this integrals of motion is that this, this model has a huge number of ground states, exponential number of ground states in N, where N is the rank of the group again. This is again very strange, but it's nevertheless true. It must be true by the existence of this, by virtue of the existence of this uh, integrals of motion. There must be a huge exponential degeneracy of ground states. Now, this behavior is not very common in quantum field theory. Usually, quantum field theories have few ground states, but this model has an exponential number. This exponential number of ground states leads to some funny conclusions about the Hagedorn temperature, because if you have an exponential number of ground states, as soon as you heat up the system just a tiny bit, you have a Hagedorn singularity at large n which is very confusing, but uh, it must be true. Finally, um, these non-invertible symmetries can be softly broken. So even though they exist only in the massless model, it doesn't mean that when we come to discuss the massive model, we have nothing to say. Because for small mass, they're kind of explicitly broken. Like in the chiral Lagrangian, we still use ideas from spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry to say some things about pion scattering though the pion is massive and not massless. So here the situation is the same. We can say some things about the massive model, though it doesn't admit strictly conserved integrals of motion, but they're approximately conserved. 
So one question that has been open for many years is the K-string tension. So the massive model is confined. It's only the massless model that's completely screened. And the question is, if it's confined, what is the tension of the string? When the quarks are very, very heavy, you can approximate the model by pure young mills theory. This was solved by Migdal 40, 50 years ago. And that's the tension of the K strings, according to the Migdal formula, which is uh, just the Casimir of some rep anti-symmetric representations. But for very light quarks, this is a strongly coupled model, and we got to use these non-invertible symmetries. There is no other way to do it, as far as I'm concerned. So you must use these uh, new integrals of motion. And we found the following result, that uh, the tension of the K-strings obeys this uh, sign rule. And that's a little, that's a funny formula because this kind of formula has been obtained in some ADS-CFT context before, completely different question. But I mean, people have written similar formulas in various other contexts and there might be some connections. But the key thing here is to see that the tension of the string contains the linear factor of the mass. That's very much like um, formulas in pion physics, that the pion mass is proportional to the quark mass, to linear order. Sorry, the mass squared of the pion is proportional to linear order in the quark mass. So here, the tension of the string is linearly proportional to the quark mass. And then there is the sign. OK, before I make two comments about naturalness, are there any questions about uh, this sort of thing? I have two more minutes. OK, so I'll just make a comment about naturalness and finish. So this model, you can deform this model by quartic operators. So these are two different quartic operators that you can add. Using these conservation rules, the non-invertible conservation rules, you can prove that this operator is entirely innocuous. It, didn't, it doesn't change anything in what I said. But this operator is a little bit more dangerous, where it's quite a bit more dangerous. It changes the dynamics very much. And you can ask, is this operator generated? Since it's dangerous, maybe it's generated by loops. Now, <clears throat> this is a little bit analogous to the question of whether the Higgs mass is generated in the standard model. So there is one reason that actually we started working on this project was that there were computations of the beta functions. And what people have found is that this operator is not generated, even if you, it's not generated if you don't put it in. And this is very confusing because the ordinary symmetries do not protect this operator. It's invariant under both the two symmetries. So it's a little bit like in the Higgs mass that somebody would tell you that it's not generated without any good underlying reason. That would be confusing. But people have done the beta function computations and they found that this is not generated. And there was no explanation. So the claim is that this non-invertible symmetries give an explanation because this operator breaks some of the non-invertible integrals of motion. And if it breaks them, it cannot be generated if it's not put in by hand in the first place. So this is an example of a violation of naturalness that uh, uh, is explained by non-symmetries. So the, or non-invertible symmetries, I should say. So the non-invertible symmetries can protect the theory against the, ge the gener generation of some dangerous operators, though they are invariant under all the standard symmetries. And of course, it's tempting to ask if something like this can operate in four dimensions for the Higgs mass. Let me just quickly uh, conclude. Sorry, Zahar, just maybe a quick point. So you claim that there is no way to find, to find any conserved quantity with these non-invertible symmetries emerging. Well, let's discuss it after I finish. Just one more minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, they just said that uh, they are very strict with time here. So. I'll just finish and then we can discuss it as much as you like. I said with the opposite, we are not strict with time. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the did not. I only heard the did. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Anyway. Um, so I argue that there are two generalizations of the notion of symmetry that have recently appeared in the literature. Uh, both condensed matter and high energy physicists are very interested in these concepts. They're very rich mathematically. Uh, there is the, also a huge mathematical community led mostly by Pavel Lettingoff and collaborators and, um, you know, and, and several others, uh, of course. Um, so they are discussing the algebra of p-dimensional, p p-dimensional p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p p
um, also non-invertible symmetries. They don't obey group structures usually. So there is a more cumbersome mathematical structure, which is called the fusion category, which is obeyed by the symmetries. Oh, and people are trying to classify the possibilities, understand what it means to gauge the symmetries, what it means to break them, what it means to have anomalies. And it's quite an exciting uh, field with lots of recent developments. Uh, my focus in this talk was to give you a few examples, just to give you a flavor of what kind of things you could expect to do if such symmetries existed. Thank you so much. Thank you for an excellent talk, a superb talk, really. Uh, sorry for rushing, for giving the impression we you should rush through. I meant it to be much more relaxed. <laughs> well, I only rushed through the second and a half. So, okay. Yeah, so there, there, I hope there are lots of questions that we can get, uh, we can get more of the details here. Yeah, I'm sorry that I rushed. Okay, it's, so it's open for questions. Can I ask a few questions? It Please, Bob. Very provocative and excellent talk. Okay. So, a lot of stuff. Okay. Yep. So, you mentioned the fusion category. Is it also modular? Is there a tensor product defined? Do you know? Yes. Yeah, the fusion category has a product structure, which is a, in the Ising model. A, so this is the simplest fusion category, okay? In the mathematical, you, 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 you probably know much more mathematics on this than me, but this is called the Zitu Tamabara Yamagami category. Does this yeah. sound familiar, these words that I just said? I can hear, but I don't know what it is, okay. Okay, so this is the simplest example of an algebraic structure that admits non-invertible integrals of motion, non-unitarily realized integrals of motion. Hmm. And mathematicians call it the Z2 Tamabara Yamagami category. That I don't, I'll check it up. This, you said Ettinghoff, is Ettinghoff, no? The mathematician. No, no, this goes before. Ettinghoff has made huge progress on this like in the recent decade. But okay. there are, this particular thing appeared before, um, we have all the references in the paper that we have on the subject. I didn't even flesh the reference, but I should say that uh, most of what I said is based on these papers with Gayoto Kapustin Cyberg, Gomi Cyberg, Omori Rumpedake Saif Neshri. And in particular, this last paper has all the details about the fusion category. It has six or seven appendices where we explained all the category theory, which, which structures go in to defining non invertible symmetries, and so on. Okay, let me uh, ask a couple more questions. So, in this model, there are no partition functions. Uh, just a second. Um, so, I didn't yet answer. Because what, can, what partition functions? For example, the Gibbs state. Oh, not because yeah. of the degeneracy. You, okay, it's an excellent question. You, part of the mathematical structure that this non invertible co-dimension one uh, topological operators allow you to do is they allow you to define partition functions with generalized chemical potentials. Hmm. What does it mean? Is that you take some cycle and you wrap this uh, topological operator around that cycle. And in that way you can define a generalization of the Gibbs state. Hmm. And do if, you do that, hmm. if you do that, then the degeneracy between these two to the n vacua splits. Hmm. And then you can define good partition functions. Okay. So if, you define a partition, if you define the partition function without this Gibbs state kind of thing, then they would all combine and you'll get a huge entropy just from the ground states. Okay. Uh, last part of the talk, you talked about infinite degeneracy. That's uh, two to uh, the end. Two to the end. Two to the end. Hmm. For any okay. finite n, it's finite. It's just okay. exponentially large. I understand. So the vacuum is degenerate. So one consequence is that the quantum field theory, the standard quantum field theory, collapses because it requires a unique vacuum. No, quantum field theory allows for several super selection sectors. Vacua are super selected. Yeah, these are two to the end super selection sectors. When I say vacua, what I mean is super selection sectors. Super selection sectors, okay. It was a bit confusing, okay. Yes, yeah, please. usually people use the words vacuum and super selection sectors inter interchangeably. I didn't know that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's it. That's what I want to write. Okay.
Um, more questions? Yeah, Zofa, maybe I can address. Yes, please, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the point is the following. So, first of all, maybe some precision. So, in principle, if I look at this, uh, when you have been describing, uh, I think, the, uh, the, the, the young males with the theta angle or the two dimensional eyes, and, no, sorry, the, uh, the n equals four uh, young males with a theta angle. And uh, so, in principle, when you show this conserved quantity, what you call n, which uh, show, uh, exhibits a uh, uh, number of symmetry relations, but that doesn't close in a, as an algebra or doesn't form a, a symmetry group. So it is always sufficient to have a description in terms of uh, the categories you mentioned or? Yeah, uh, people conjecture that the non-invertible symmetries in quantum field theory always combine to a fusion category. Mm -hmm. It's a conjecture. Yeah, I understand. But uh, also, for example, in, when you described this Migdal result was a uh, heavy quarks, and uh, then this quartic interaction, uh, and with this extra piece, which is like with a two splitted uh, 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 factors, uh, then is there uh, Zohar a universal procedure how one should look for this implicit symmetries or non inventable symmetry? Yeah, that's okay. This is more like an art. Uh, I mean, if I gave you this Lagrangian, it would be very difficult to, for you to guess that it has an exponential number of conservation rules, uh, conservation rules at zero mass. Okay? Right. It's sure. very, very difficult. And the art, the art in this business is to find them, to find ways yeah. to, to find ways to find this non this to find the symmetries. This, this is more like an art. It's not very systematic. Yeah, but I understand. But uh, like you understand what I mean is that uh, so there is no any set, for example, set of constraints which is coming from the fusion categories or something. Like you say, if you have this two, this splitted piece which is generated and does satisfy all the invariants, but uh, a priori, if you don't add, you don't find the associated symmetry. It should satisfy. You, so there is no systematic procedure, even not systematic. There is there are no constraints on 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 finding this non-invertibility. No, there, there are constraints. Mathematic, <coughs> mathematicians prove that the number of fusion categories is sparse. So fusion categories cannot come in continuous families. That's, that's what I'm asking, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's called the rigid, it's called, it's a fundamental theorem that's called the rigidity theorem. We review it in the paper. That okay. I read. It's called the rigidity theorem. So there are discrete, like there are discrete groups. Uh, okay. They don't come in continuous families. The same is true for these non-invertible symmetries. They come in some discrete, Families. I see, I see. But mathematicians did not classify them yet. It's a, huge, it's a big, big open problem in the field. I, in Minutes, um, there was an effort to classify them, as you've seen on um, yes, uh, and their websites. Joost Slingerland has been working on that. Correct. Um, but may, may, can you tell us uh, for n equals 2, there are 16. Well, it's the invertible. It's, Do you know which one it is? Yeah, we classified them. So in the paper, we worked out the cases of n equals two, three, four, five, and six ex very explicitly. So we wrote down all the conservation rules and all the and their algebra. Okay. But in the general case, we did not. We don't have the full fusion algebra. It's too complicated. Yes, and, I can. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And uh, but we still can prove some things about it, like the size of the representations that it has or the number of vacua that it must lead to. We can prove some things, that, or the string tension. Also the string tension, my student Sahan was able to prove is this formula for all N and K. Mm -hmm. This is without knowing the full fusion algebra completely. Uh, so you can do some things without knowing all the multiplication rules. But indeed, uh, the classification problem of this non-invertible symmetries is still an open problem. And many, many people like uh, those that Denja mentioned, but also Gannon. Uh, yeah, Terry Gannon, yeah. Mm. yeah. Terry Gannon are working on this. I have yeah, Di, Di Evans usually joins us, but he's probably busy today. Okay. Can you ask one more question? Sure. If I compose, suppose in, in these models, where uh, you have these uh, non standard symmetries, suppose I compose two systems. And so you take, for example, the tensor product of 
two of say two one particle states two, for their analogs then the symmetry to act on this tensor product one needs a coproduct on the symmetry group symmetry algebra yes. do they exist so are these co algebras yeah you can uh, if you tensor product two different models Mm -hmm. There is a fusion category which is obtained by a tensor product of the two fusion categories. Oh, yes. okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is usually in the mathematics community, this product is, is usually denoted by a box with mm -hmm. a cross inside. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So these are co algebras as well. Okay. Yes. So these are, okay. can, can I ask a, a couple of questions? Um, the, the co-dimension two charges that, that you described, um, the, are they, the, there's a walled Hurry construction of charges on co-dimension two manifolds for, extent, for diffeomorphic invariant theories. Are, are, is, are his charges an example of this? Oh, I see. Um, there's no touch charges. He, he, was looking, he was interested in black hole entropy. And it looks very similar. Yeah, it's a good question. You're not talking about the ADM charges. You're talking about the wall charges, right? Not ADM charges, no, Ear and Wald. There's a paper by Ear, I-Y-E-R and Robert Wald. Oh, yes, yes. It's a really good question. I've never thought about it. I have nothing, so I, I don't have any useful response. That was, that was purely classical, of course. I mean, he wasn't doing unitary stuff. It was purely classical diffeomorphism in variant theory. Oh, it's also classical. The fact that these are- Sure, yeah, yeah. The existence of the charges is classical, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I actually don't know. But was there an analog of the fact that these charges that they defined was to, were independent of the two-dimensional surface? Oh yes, yeah, that was that was, yes, that was that was the whole point of it. This is Wald and whom? Wald and? Um, and I, I may I may be pronouncing it wrongly. E R I Y E R. This is a, yeah, it's a good comment. Highly cited in the GR literature. I think I've seen this in some talks. I've seen these charges in uh, talks about black hole entropy, but I've never like made the connection. Okay, and I have a second question, which is a, a lot more um, trivial. The, um, you pointed out that when theta's pi, um, you have time reversal symmetry, and you'll also have parity invariance when theta's pi. Yes. For the same reason. Um, and the experimental limits of theta QCD, when they, they use the dielectric moment of the neutron, I think, to put an upper bound of theta QCD, um, is wh what are the experimental limits? I mean, is, is, is theta equal pi excluded experimentally? Are there any experiments that actually exclude theta equal pi? Uh, I think theta equals pi in the end of the day is excluded because of that, that it would lead to spontaneous breaking of time. So time reversal symmetry is a symmetry, but unfortunately it's spontaneously broken. And experimentally this would be uh, disastrous. Because that would mean. Oh, so, so you're saying that although time reversal is a symmetry from theta is pi naively, it's actually spontaneously broken. Right. Ah, okay, I, right, okay. Ah. So I think that one can use this to rule it out essentially. Yeah, okay. If it has to be spontaneously broken, then certainly. Yeah, it has to be spontaneously broken because of this anomaly that I explained. Uh -huh. Okay. And if it's spontaneously broken, it's kind of disastrous to experiment because that means that particle excitations. Oh, yeah, sure, it's definitely. Um, Time reversal symmetry is there in, 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 in QCD, that's... Yeah, so I think that, in fact, you know, there is a very fun fact that I've learned through this thing, which is that even when you go to the Chiral Lagrangian and you put theta equals pi, time reversal symmetry is spontaneously broken. So it's, it's something that, I claimed it here for young Mills theory, but you can generalize this theorem even for <laughs> theories with massive quarks. Even for theories with massive quarks, it's still true. And even if you take the quarks to be very light, where you can use the current Lagrangian, it's still true. So you can just check it in classical, in classical physics using the current Lagrangian, that indeed time reversal symmetry is broken at theta equals pi, spontaneously. Is it due to level crossing that this is happening? C can you repeat? At theta equal to pi, at least uh, in simple models, there is a level crossing. Ah, uh, this yeah, yeah, this is like, yeah, this is a little bit analogous to level crossing. Every first order phase, this is, a, so at large n, uh, we know that this transition is first order. It's just the appearance of two vacua. Hmm. 
And every such thing can be interpreted as level crossing, right? A first order transition is nothing but uh, one level overtaking another level. Okay, good. In the quantum mechanical model that you mentioned of a particle in a circle, it's literally just level crossing. Yes. Indeed, yes. Okay. Some more questions? Thank you very much for yeah. The oh, thank thank you for the. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and we can uh, we can uh, ask. Thank well, thank you for an excellent talk and it was very inspiring for us. Uh, thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Really good. I should go. Yeah. And